Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm an airline pilot and welcome to your tutorial for the Black Square TBM 850. We are going to run this tutorial together with the Black Square checklists from the manual and I'm going to teach you exactly how to fly the airplane. So be sure to have your manual ready as that is what you will need. Do note however that I adapted a couple of the procedures where I pointed out in the video as I have also used the actual airplanes pilots operating handbook that you can find available for free on the manufacturer's website which you can quickly find through a Google search for TBM 850 POH. So. That is how we are going to do today's video. We are standing at Fort Myers Airport in southern Florida and we are going to fly this one over to Key West which is a quick 30 minute IFR flight. So going right over into the cockpit I have selected the GNS 530 configuration for today's flight as that is what everybody has available but feel free to, ch to switch to the GTN 750 for your flight or even to do them in uh, good old school analog style using the KNS 80 navigation system. However this is not going to be a tutorial on the KNS 80 so we are going to focus on the GNS 530 as everybody has that available. A quick tip though for those using the GTN 750 with a click on the SD card up here you can swap between the TDS and the PMS units so that you can switch which one you want to use in case you have both. Alright though, we are going to use the GNS 530 for today's flight. We're going to start this one with the pre-flight procedure that we have in the normal checklist section of the Black Square manual. So let's go ahead with that as it prepares us for our flight. So crash lever up, that's the one up here. Then source selector off, generator selector main, starter off, ignition off or auto. Now auto basically is only going to turn the ignition on in case the starter is selected. However I do find it safer since we are still about to do a walk around. I do find it safer to keep the ignition in off because otherwise it makes no difference for the uh, switch. Okay exterior lights all off. Gyro instruments all off. Emergency lights test. Those are located up here and they are this little um, switch here. And when I turn that up you can see the brightness of the lamps is increasing a little bit. When I turn it back down you can see it decreasing again so that the emergency lights are tested. Okay, circuit breakers all in and this is an important one since circuit breakers can and do pop in the, TB in the uh, TBM 850 as in any black square aircraft. So they're all in. The de-icing switches are all off. We find them down here on the lower left and they are look, uh, switched all off. The landing gear control is down. Autopilot and trim master off. Radio master off. Bleed air off. Air conditioning off. Pressurization dump switch is guarded. Ram air handle pushed in. That's down here. And then we've got the auto fuel selector that is on manual. We've got the auxiliary boost pump off. Tank selector left or right. Now we've put him on the left tank today as both tanks have equal fuel quantity. ELT armed. So that's here in the middle position. If the ELT is not armed you can hear it straight away. So ELT is armed. Park and brake set manual override lever that's the one down here a little bit hard to see but you have it here on the left that one and that is in the off position power lever flight idle prop rpm uh, propeller lever maximum condition lever cutoff flap control up and now we are going to start checking a couple of systems for our pre-flight so we'll start by doing everything on the battery today. We are not going to use the uh, ground power unit since it is not available everywhere. Okay, so source selector, battery. Make sure the voltage is greater than 25.5 and you can see it's just about that. Um, so voltage is above 25. Then exterior light panel. We perform the lights test. 
But that only tests the three lights we have on here. We are going to do the full light test in a few moments when we head outside. So that's the exterior light panel tested. Fuel gauges, check quantity. And our quantity is looking good for the flight today. Then advisory panel, check one and two. So that's the test switch up here. And we're going to move it up, hold it, make sure everything illuminates. And the same for moving it down, hold it, make sure everything is illuminating. Then we go on to the oxygen annunciator that's down here, and that is extinguished. Interior lights as required. Now it's daylight today, so I'm going to leave them off, but you would find them mostly down here, and then you'd have further lights uh, located over here, for example. Here you can switch them on and off, and so on. Okay, so interior lights as needed. Environmental panel. We do the light test down here. Works. Then we move on to the flaps, put them down. And we can verify they're coming down on the flap indication over here. Then landing gear panel, light test. Number one, number two. Okay. Then we are next up going to test the pito heats. So you will notice we still have the pito one, two and stall heater indication illuminate on our master caution panel. So we're going to switch on pitot heater 1 and pitot heater 2, those two switches down here, and we can see the lights are now extinguished. Now we can switch them back off again, and the lights are coming back on, so the system is working. Next up, we are going to run the light test on the de-icing panel. You can see all the five lights are illuminated. Let that go again. And finally, we are going to make sure that all our exterior lights are working. So I am going to flick them all on and now we can go outside and have a very quick look into the lights to make sure that they're actually working. So we're going to start on the side of the wing over here. You can see we've got our strobe lights illuminated. The lights in front and in the back are on and then we've got our landing light up here which is illuminated as well. Next up, we are going to walk around the airplane. Do note, we do not have a beacon light up here. Check the um, taxi lights. And then move to the other side of the wing. And over here, once again, landing light is working. And we've got the green navigation light, the strobe light, and the white navigation light. Alright, and that is really all the lights there are for this airplane. So that is all that we can check up here. Nothing fancy sitting on the top of the stabilizer or anything the likes. Okay, so let's conserve a little bit of battery there and go right back into the cockpit and turn everything off again. Like that. And then we can turn the source selector back off. Okay, and that is our pre-flight checklist complete. From here on, I am switching away from the black square manual and into the actual airplane's um, flight operation manual. And we are going outside for the walk around. So we're going to start it on the left wing. And we are going to move around the plane basically in a clockwise direction. So the walk around is officially started at the passenger entrance door. So let's move all the way to the back and start up here. Okay then, so on the left hand wing we do check the flaps, make sure that they do have a little bit of play. Aileron and uh, trim and the spoilers, so that's up here. You can nicely see the aileron trim just over here on that uh, little back. Okay, um, then we move on, trailing edge static discharger and that those are in place on the side over here. Wingtip, navigation light, strobe light, landing light. We checked their condition already. Moving on, we've got the um, OAT probe and the condition is checked. Then we can just about go down here and we have our pito probe up here as well. Okay then, let's move up again and make sure that our fuel tank is properly closed, which it is. You can nicely see that by the um, handle being flush with the um, tank. Okay, then we move forward, make sure there's no damages, make sure that all the boots are looking good, which they are. 
and that leads us down to the landing gear so over here we first of all we check the condition of the tires make sure that everything is all right and then we check the um, shock absorbers up here make sure everything is looking good no fluids leaking or nothing the likes lastly we have a look into the wheel well which as we can see is looking fine as well okay then from there we can move on up front to the forward compartment which is the uh, baggage door and that is looking good from there the gpu door if external power is not used is closed which it is then moving on to the forward circuit fuel drain we would um, drain some fuel over here make sure there is no water in here unfortunately that is not simulated in the black square aircraft one of the very few things that actually isn't okay then Normally we'd also have a quick look into the engine cowlings, so let's quickly open them up. We've got the hidden click spots down here on the pedal adjust um, levers. And we can use those to open up the um, cowling. Have a look in there. For the first flight of the day, make sure the oil cap is closed. And then we are going to uh, check the oil level and the fuel pipes. Make sure there is no leak, no deterioration or wear and then we can basically close the engine cowlings once again so let's do that both sides that's it okay then moving on a little bit further forward to make sure that there are no cracks in the air inlet and that um, the inlets are unobstructed and we're going to verify that on all of them one two and three Okay, next up we're going to check the condition of the propeller and the spinner and over here basically we check the leading edges making sure that there are no damages. You can see over here Black Square have simulated that one very very nicely. So you can see that there is a little bit of stuff on here that's basically all the insects that are getting torn apart while the propeller is spinning and all possible damages on the leading edges. So we are going to inspect the leading edges of all four propeller blades making sure that there is nothing on them and that they are still in a good condition which they do seem to be up here very good all right that uh, part in front over here that's part of the propeller de-icing then the spinner itself is also looking good and the air is uh, unobstructed on the air inlet that's looking good from here we can go down to the nose wheel and once again we check the um, landing lights, shock absorbers, the doors, the um, tires, and finally have a look into the wheel well as well, which we got down here, and that is looking good as well. Nothing leaking. Perfect. That's how it, sh how it is supposed to be. All right, so that's pretty much the um, nose wheel. And then we have a look on the other side as well. Once again, we've got our air inlet over here where we need to make sure that there is um, nothing on there. And then we can move on to the aft part of the, or to the uh, right hand wing. So on the right wing, once again, fuel drain, we would do that. However, that's not simulated here. Check the condition of the de-icing boots, check the general condition of the airplane. Then we've got our stall warning over here where we just check for the um, condition. So on the stall warning up here, that when the airplane comes in at a very high angle of attack, then this little plate up here is blown upwards by the flow of the incoming air. And that is when it touches the uh, top, then you basically close in an electrical circuit. And like that, the uh, stall warning would uh, be triggered. Okay then. Moving a little bit further outwards, once again we've got our um, fuel tank, which we make sure is flush, and then the condition of the lights, the condition of the um, outer part of the wing, we check that our trailing edge uh, static discharges are in place, move on to the aileron and make sure that the aileron itself is um, yeah, rigidly connected but don't touch the um, trim tab surface over here so you can see on the other wing we had the aileron trim at the end of the aileron that is on the left side on the right side up here we don't have that over here we have the trim tab which is basically let's call it somewhat of a permanent trim that is supposed to be adjusted to your typical cruising speeds 
so that you don't need to trim the actual ailerons while you're in cruise, as that avoids a little bit of drag. Going on from there, we check the flaps, make sure that everything is looking good over here, make sure they don't have too much play, and then we can move on to the end of, or to the uh, continuous panel. So over here, we've got the oxygen service ports, and make very sure that in here, the um, valve is not actually closed because that is something that you can't change again in flight when that happens then well you are well screwed over and you can land again to close it manually okay from there we move to the rear section and over here we've got the elt door which is closed and latched and then we've got the uh, static pressure port that is just down here Make sure that's clear, as the sticker already indicates. Make sure that our ventral fins are um, checked, and then we are going to have a quick look underneath the fuselage, making sure that the area where a possible tail strike might occur is not um, obstructed, and this is looking good. This down here, by the way, is, if I'm not totally mistaken, the radio altimeter antenna, but I might be mistaken. This could be radio altitude as well. So this might as well be com or uh, gps but normally gps should be on top of the plane so yeah that's the gps antenna right up here all right then so next up make sure that the outflow is not um restricted up here and then we move up to the stabilizer have a look at that even though stabilizer well yes they do call it a horizontal stabilizer those stabilizers are normally fully trimmed but that's getting too much into the theory. Okay then, the DI's boots are looking good, and the elevators are looking good as well. Static discharger is still in place, and everything is looking good on the connection top there, nothing loose. And then we can move over to the other end side of the plane, and over here we check for the same thing. Do note the um, elevator trim up here. And then we can move over. Okay, quick look into the rudder and the rudder trim, everything looking good over here as well and then once again we've got the um, static port on the side and with that we are basically done with our walk around okay then let's head back into the airplane and have a look into our um, cabin so we are going to start with the aft part of the cabin because that contains a couple of uh, tricks for us so at first let's move into the plastic compartment and close the doors so first things first we've got the uh, key for the baggage door up here so you can somewhat see that our baggage door is open up there in the front now if I'm clicking that key it's closing the baggage door as you can see so that's a pretty useful thing there to know and next up we are going to close the doors now you can either make your life simple and press the um, press to close the door button or first of all in any case we need to retract the steps or you could just move out here, reach out to the door handle, and that is going to close the door as well. When the door is closed, pay particular attention to those um, red stripes up there, which have to become green when the door is locked. Otherwise, the pressurization is not going to be possible. And this is an important thing to check. Keep in mind, you're sitting in a black square aircraft, and chances are that the failure is simulated of those. Okay, apart from that, not a lot that we need to do here in the back so let's move up to the front same thing up here we can go ahead and uh, close the doors but I am going to keep this one open for just a little bit longer because of the cabin temperatures if you have a look down here at the cabin temperature gauge we've got 29 degrees in here and the one from the outside air isn't powered yet but you will see fairly quickly that it does get pretty hot in here pretty quickly when we close the doors so keeping the doors open is going to keep the temperatures under control and just in case you're wondering yes all of that is simulated you can even ventilate it a little bit better by opening the aft door as well okay anyway that is not our intention for the day so let's continue with the black square manual and the before starting engines checklist so we've got the pre-flight inspection complete nose baggage door closed engine compartment closed cabin access door latched pilot door latched now since we're about to start our engines let's go ahead and actually close it so we are going to retract the steps 
and then we are going to close the door. And once again, in here you've got some of those indicators as well. Like here's a red one that's now turned green. And then we've got the same in the front here as well. So make sure that those are all latched. Same up here and up here. Okay, perfect. So that's our door latched. Then park and brake set. Seats and seat belts fastened. Oxygen pressure check. You can find that gauge up here and you can see we've got sufficient oxygen pressure for the flight. If you ever need to refill that because it's showing a lower value, then you can do that on that weather radar panel up here. You can see um, if you go to the nav page then you enter the systems conditions up here and here you can refill the oxygen as well as repair the engine in case you've broken yours. And up here on the lock page you can trigger the failures but that is really... Um, not interesting for today's tutorial. Okay, so the oxygen pressure is checked, then we turn the oxygen supply on, and this is the supply for the complete airplane. Up here, you've got the switch for the passenger's oxygen masks, but we are not going to touch those today, instead we will simply use the um, overall oxygen system. Okay, so microphone select the normal, you find that down here, and this basically switches between the microphone from the pilot's headset, that you can plug in down here, and the microphone from your um, and the microphone from your oxygen mask. My apologies, I didn't mean to hit that one. Okay, so otherwise it would use the microphone from um, the oxygen mask. Interesting to note over here: the captain's mask is located on the right, and the first officer's or the passenger's mask is located up here on the left. That simply provides easier access. Okay then. Now we get into the range of starting up the engine, so let's make sure that we're actually safe to turn on power again. Starter off, ignition, auto or off. We're going to go with the off position. Then landing gear control is down. And next up we've got a special feature of this airplane. Now in case you are at an airport where you need an IFR and a startup clearance before you start up the plane, with the battery still off, so you can see source selector is still off, but the crash bar needs to be up for this to work. With that done, if we turn on the radio master down here, you can see it powers up only our COM1. Now in this case, COM1 is attached to the GNS530, so for that reason, the GNS530 is powering up. If you had the GTN750 installed, the same would happen to it, or if you only have the KX155 radio installed, then only that radio would power up. So that way you can call for ATC clearance without having to turn on the entire avionics which would drain your battery a little bit quicker. Okay, nonetheless today we are going to start up without clearance so I am going to turn this one off again, radio master off. Okay then, now we're ready to turn on the power so source selector can go on. Horn test, that's back here. is done. Door annunciator extinguished. Now if you don't know where a certain light would be located you can somewhat see them up here so here would be doors but you can always just put it in the test position and now you can clearly see where the door light would be. So the door annunciator is extinguished and then we can go ahead. Fuel gauges check the quantity which is looking good. Auto fuel selector to auto that's the one up here and then auxiliary boost pump on and make sure that the fuel pressure is in the green. Then we are going to check the engine instruments. Basically up here we are looking for um, temperatures, stuff like that. And we are going to run the ITT test to make sure that this gauge is working. This is probably the most important gauge for starting up your engine. Okay, so that's working and finally exterior lights. Once we are ready to start, we are going to switch the strobe light on. And that's the before starting engine checklist complete. There's two different start procedures depending on if you're using the battery or the ground power unit. For today we are going to go with the engine start on the battery, so let's run that checklist. So, manual override lever off. That's the one we have located down here in the black. That's a little hard to see. So, power lever, flight idle, propeller lever, max RPMs, condition lever, cut off, source select, battery, auxiliary fuel pump is on, and the pressure is green. Then, ignition, auto, and before I turn on the starter, let me quickly talk you over what I expect to see. 
So when we put the starter on, the um, starter light is going to start flashing and the ignition light is going to come on. The NG is going to start increasing and at 13% we are going to put the condition lever into the low idle position. Next up we are going to monitor our ITT and up here there's two things that we need to be sure of. First of all, 1090 is maximum temperature, that's the red arrow on the bottom over there. However, the temperature may only be above 1000 degrees centigrade for a maximum of 5 seconds. So that's the first thing we check. More than 1000 for a maximum of 5 seconds. The second thing we check is that the temperature goes below 870 degrees, that's kind of the red line over here, within 20 seconds. When NG reaches 50%, we're going to turn off the starter, ensure that we've got sufficient oil pressure and that the oil pressure light up here is extinguished, and then we can move the condition lever into high idle, and that basically concludes the engine startup sequence. So things are going to go rather quick, but I wanted to tell you about this before we actually start with the engine start process. Alright then, good to go, then let's commence our engine start. So, starter on, starter light is flashing, ignition is on, let's cancel that master caution. And now the NG is increasing, we will shortly see our propeller RPMs increase as well. So, NG, 13%. Condition lever on. Now monitor the ITT. If it goes over a thousand, we need to count the seconds. Maximum five seconds and is below a thousand already. And for 20 seconds below 870, perfect. Okay, NG reaches 50%. Condition lever high idle and starter off. Perfect. And that is our engine start basically completed. The engine has now stabilized and we can go ahead with the procedure auxiliary boost pump auto verify the um, fuel pressure annunciation is extinguished main generator annunciator is extinguished voltmeter is now at about 28 volts and the battery is charging so the up meter is in the positives over here and that's the engine start on battery completed well that done we can now go ahead and do the after starting engines checklist. So gyro instruments all on. Then the gyro suction is in the green. Okay, next up we're going to check our de-icer, so prop de-ice, turn it on. Left windshield, right windshield. We already checked the pedo heaters earlier, so we don't need to do that again. Inertial separator on, and we can check the airframe DIs as well. Make sure that the boots are working, and basically just verify that we've got the green light illuminate on one side, and then thereafter we will see the um, green light illuminate on the other side when the, when the um, other cycle starts. So now it's switched over, make sure that, we've, that that's working. And then we can switch it back off again. Okay, from here on, we make sure that the ampere meter is below plus 50, which it is, and then we can switch the generator standby once again, verify that the uh, voltmeter is tw at or above 28 and the ammeter is um, zero or charging, and then we can switch the generator back to the main generator, and like that we've now checked that the generator is actually working. Okay then, now we move back down. Flaps are going up, bleed air, auto, air conditioning, let's switch it on, fan flow, auto. It is rather hot inside here, you can see we've now got 37 degrees centigrade in our airplane from just the short time we took to close the doors and, and uh, start up the engine. But now you can see that the temperature is coming back slowly, so the air conditioning is working. Alright, going on from there, we make sure the cabin temperature is set, we've put it to something above 20, so something like 22 degrees or so, and that should be sufficient for our plane to cool down. 
If the plane cannot cool down just based on the um, bleed air in auto, you, we can turn the bleed air to high, and that is going to increase our plane's ventilation. Okay, the airflow distributor, that's that little switch down here, is set to normal. And the um, cabin climb rate is showing all right. Can set the um, field elevation a little bit down up here, and that could trigger a uh, cabin rate of climb, but it doesn't that is fine with me however okay then next up make sure the weather radar is off or standby it's off in our case and then we can go ahead and flick on the radio master the ethos master that we have up here and then we turn on the autopilot and trim master ethos source is selected to the left hand side electric trim we're going to test that so we've got the switch up here on the control column Trim down, you can see it responds. Trim up, it responds. And then we can select the trim basically to something neutral or just put it into the green arc, like so. Okay, then inertial separator light is illuminated now. Remember we turned that on earlier when we set the de-icing panel. And with that, our after-start procedure is basically complete, except for the park and brake and the brake check. But before we do those, we are quickly going to set up the GPSs for our flight. So it is going to be an IFR flight, so let's set a squawk, something like 2000 as a default IFR squawk. Frequencies, well, I'm not flying on VATSIM today, but nonetheless, I like to set my standard VATSIM frequencies. So Unicom on number one, and then we can turn on the guard frequency in number two make sure that we are listening to both and transmitting on number one so the upper part is what you're listening on the lower part is what you're transmitting on okay so from here on let's go into the flight plan and i will take out my navigraph charts in order to um, have our route visible yep. what's that doing come on that's better okay then Let's go ahead with our route setup. So, we're going to depart KRSW, and you can either do it realistically and dial those letters in, which is how you would do it in uh, the real life, or you can follow that little shortcut there from um, working title, and you simply press that little keyboard button up there, now you can enter the keyboard uh, letters as well. So we can just type Marcy, Southeast USA, looks good. From there we are going to fly towards Rigor. Next one is going to be Gig. Or Giggy, I should pronounce it. And then we continue towards Sting. Alright, and finally enter our destination, which is going to be Key West. Like so. Okay, perfect. And that is everything in. Now let's go ahead and select our procedures. For the departure, we're going to go via the Scooby 7 departure. Now, in terms of the wind, it is really... Um, just coming from the right it doesn't really matter which runway we go to so how about we decide based on shortest taxi standing up here and that means runway 06 is the closest nearby so let's go for that and we load that up okay then very quick check here through the route make sure everything is in which it is at this point we could also program our approach already which is going to be the Arnav Alpha from Sting and we can load that up so just a quick check through our route, making sure everything is okay, which it is. Perfect. Alright, and that is all the setup we need. Personally, I like to switch to this display on the left side, and then keep the uh, flight plan on the right side, so that we got a good idea of where we are going. Also, a quick look into the Scooby 7 departure, which is quite easy. Continue on the runway heading until uh, 400 feet, and then make a right hand turn onto heading 100. Climb it to an altitude of 3,000 feet, and those 3,000 we can pre-select up here. Okay, that's set. And then let's um, 
A quick look over here, runway 6, climbing right turn, heading 100, are as assigned for vectors to join the filed route. So we are going to receive vectors to the route, climb the 3000, MSA wise we've got 2600, that is fine with us as well. And the altimeter is 29095, and we've got to make sure that this is actually selected on both sides, so both left and right, 29095 is in. Okay then. Right, that looks good to me. And with that, I would say we are ready to go. So let's uh, let's use the uh, safe taxi map in here, because I kind of like it. Parking up here in front of the hangars, and we're going to go out and then on to Alpha 1. Or maybe we can even go to Alpha 5 on the left side, that might be even quicker. And then we end up straight at the wrong way, so Alpha. And then we can go for whatever intersection we like. Personally, I feel lucky today. Let's take Alpha 4. We need about a thousand meters. Now before we start the taxi, let's quickly set up the nav source to GPS up there and have a quick look into the product manual once more. Because I want you to understand how to calculate your takeoff data. So going into the product manual, we will find a couple of tables for our flight. Now those tables are located they are somewhat hidden inside the system descriptions, so it does take a while to find them. They start on page 61. So we need to go like all the way down, page 61. Here we go, that's the engine power setting tables. And those we need to somewhat memorize what we need for our departure. Well, the takeoff power setting luckily is easy, regardless if you're at sea level or if you're in 8,000 feet. It's always 100% torque and 2,000 RPMs on the propeller. So that's quite easy. And then we can go down to the climb performance. We can already see that a standard climb is conducted at 130 knots, and the torque is going to be 121%. So those are the two important things we need to remember. Takeoff power. 100% torque, 2000 RPMs, and climb power, 121% torque, 2000 RPMs. Alright, and that is what we needed to have a look at over here. Now we can continue with our procedures and we can continue with the taxi. So let's put that chart somewhere in the uh, edge of the screen where we can make good use of them for a taxi like so. Okay then, finishing up the after start procedures, we've got the uh, park and brake release. Make sure the park and brake annunciator is extinguished and then we can start our taxi for which we're going to turn on the taxi light and then we can start moving. Now here's a little info on how to taxi this airplane. Be very careful with the throttle. So, look at that. I'm moving it up front, and it takes a time for the engine to respond. The plane isn't rolling yet, so let's move it a little bit further. But once the plane starts rolling, things are gonna go pretty quick. So, again, you can see it's still not moving. Let's use a bit more power. And here we go. Okay, then brakes checked. But you can see now it's developing a lot of power pretty quickly. Once it's rolling, we are just going to return the power to the idle position, and that is all we need. Now, for those of you who are aware of how turboprop aircraft work, you will be familiar with the term beta range. For the entire rest of you who hear this topic for the first time today, you don't need to worry about it too much. Basically, beta range means turning the propeller into a range where it is no longer producing thrust, even with the engine running. Now, that would normally be conducted by lifting up that little gate down here and then pulling the propeller somewhat to the back, or the um, power lever, I should say. Now, in the simulator, Microsoft Flight Simulator does simply not support the beta range. It's not possible to do that. 
However, what you can do, and what you should do, when you pull your power lever into the idle position, Black Square has simulated somewhat of a beta range application, and therefore pulling it into idle is basically going to provide a zero thrust position for you. And that is like a little cheat you can use in order to control your um, taxi. Now, once the plane is moving, be sure to keep head on the speed because it is very easy to um, lose track and go much too quick. Also, taxi and plane on ground, nose wheel steering is quite good. However, you will need occasional differential braking in order to control the airplane. As you are entering turns on the taxi, make sure that all your instrument indications are correct. So when you're turning to the right, let me just veer off the taxi a little bit to the left there. So watch those indications. The turn indicator, showing a right turn, the ball is deflected and the compass is turning. That's the important things for us here. Same the other way when you're turning left. You need to check them both during taxi, however it is easiest combined with the regular turns that you have to do anyway. Okay then, reaching the holding point, let's put the airplane into a slight displacement towards the approach and the runway and then we are going to stop over here, set the parking brake and since we've stopped I'm also going to turn the taxi light off. Okay, parking brake is on, that's what where the master warning came from. Perfect. We don't need those charts anymore, and now we can continue with the before takeoff procedure. Now, a little word on the before takeoff procedure. In the Black Square manual, they have you exercise the propeller and do the governor test when you are standing at the holding point. In the pilot operating handbook from the real airplane manufacturer, they want you to do that when you're on the runway and about to set takeoff thrust. That's probably just saving a little bit on a noise and so on. Today we are going to run everything straight out of the black square manual, so do pay your attention to that, please. Okay then, before takeoff checklist. Park and set, park and annunciator illuminated, terrain test push, that's located down here. Alright, and with that, the um, tour test is conducted. Next up, we are going to do a run-up. That's the part that the POH of the airplane manufacturer wants you to do on the um, runway. But both are going to work. So we're going to increase thrust until we've achieved a prop RPMs of 1900. Personally, while I'm doing that, I'm always looking a little bit outside to make sure the airplane doesn't break free from the brakes. You need maybe one third of um, thrust lever application there. And here we go, that's 1900. So, exercise propeller to feather. And that is a little difficult with the click spots, so I'm going to move over like this. So, propeller to feather works. Then we can move it all the way up front again. And now we are going to do the governor check. You've got that little button over here. And we are going to give that a test. So you can see we've got 1900 RPMs on the propeller. When I click the button, we want to observe a drop between 50 and 250 RPMs. Click the button. Look at that. We lost like maybe 80 RPMs. Release the button. And the RPMs are going back up to 1900. And with that done, we can return our power lever to flight idle and run the rest of our checks. So fuel imbalance less than 15 gallons. You can see we've used up a little bit of our fuel here and you can see that the plane is automatically switching between the two different tanks. So it sensed that we had a slight imbalance and now it went to the left tank. And that is what this fuel selector auto button is doing. You can however shift that around manually and we basically had to shift it to the fullest tank and as you see it did that automatically just in the moment we've been looking down there little coincidence but that's how it works okay then next up flaps 
into the takeoff position. Observe the flaps and takeoff there. Then P2 heat can come on. De icing system as required. We don't need any of that today. And inertial separator as needed. Now, if you took off on an unprepared surface, such as, for example, a gravel runway or a grass runway, then you want that inertial separator to be on. If you're taking off on a well-paved runway like we are going to do today, then you can turn it off. However, just for the purpose of the tutorial, I am going to leave it on in order to show you a trap that many of you will probably fall into in case the inertial separator is on for takeoff. So I am going to keep it on on purpose. However, in the situation in which we are currently, no icing conditions and um, a prepared surface, so a good asphalt runway, you would not need it. Okay then. Advisory panel, all off except inert sap and parking brake. Inert sap as needed, that's the inertial separator. Then engine instruments are checked, flight controls. Looking good and the rudder is good as well. So, ampere meter below 50. And then we can release our parking brake and roll onto the runway for our takeoff. As we line up on the runway, I am going to flick on those lights. And we'll turn on the pulse lights as well for as long as we are below the transition altitude. Okay, line up. Clear on the right, clear on the left. The wind will be coming from the right hand side on the takeoff, that means we are going to use some right hand aileron and we expect to, to use left rudder in order to keep us on that runway during the takeoff. So anticipate that as it will turn out quite helpful. Okay, on the runway, ready to go. And here comes the next important thing that we need to take away from the manual. And we can find that just in the front, which is the maneuvering speed. So if we go like all the way up, over here we've got our takeoff speeds. And we need to remember a couple. Rotation is always 85 knots. And the best angle of climb is 95, best rate of climb 123. Now, if you look into the original pilot operating handbook from the manufacturer, they want you to do the following. Rotate to a pitch of 7.5 degrees, retract the landing gear, and then keep that 7.5 degree pitch while you accelerate. Depending on your weight, you either want to retract the flaps at 110 or at 115. Now, we're at the max takeoff weight today, so we are going to retract the flaps at 115 knots. Our climb speed then is going to be 130 and we're going to go straight to that. So that is our takeoff profile. Now we don't need to take any minimum altitudes or so into account for the flap retraction because that is, well, more relevant to large jet aircraft than to small ones like this. Okay, so let's also talk about takeoff power setting. Now, you want to set your takeoff power to 100 torque, 100% torque. However, it is easy to set your power lever beyond the 100% torque. The, the airplane got a torque limiter installed that is going to limit your torque to 100. However, as you're flying a black square aircraft, chances are it might fail and then you can easily over torque the airplane on takeoff. And we don't want that to happen. So for that reason, advance your power lever slowly and then do the manual control of the torque to get it just at 100%. The next thing we need to talk about is what we're going to do with the torque afterwards. I just told you that the airplane got a torque limiter which limits torque to 100%. However, you will remember from the manual that our climb table told us to go for 121.4% torque, which is the red line that you see down here. And that is where a special feature of the TBM 850 comes into account, and that is the so-called 850 mode. Now you see that 850 up there. We get into the 850 mode no earlier than after the flaps are completely retracted, 
And when the flaps are completely in, then you can move that flap lever one step further up and it will enter the 850 mode. When that happens, your engine is no longer limited at 100% torque, but at 121.4%. And that is your full power. In case you're wondering where that comes from, I'll just make it short. The TBM 850 is based on the TBM 700, which had 700 horsepowers. The TBM 850 can go up to 850 horsepowers. However, it is not certified to do that for takeoff. And for that reason, when you go into 850 mode, you basically limit, release the limit of 700 horsepowers, which you've got at 100% torque, and raise it to 850 horsepowers, which is the which is the 121% um, torque position. Okay, once we're airborne, we are going to tap the brakes and then retract the landing gear. That is to avoid gyroscopic effects from the turning wheels as we um, take off. After takeoff, put on the yaw damper and follow our sit. Now, for the purpose of today's video, we are going to use the autopilot as much as possible. So I'll endeavor to put it on as soon as we have completed the first turn at 430 feet. So 430 feet, make a right turn, heading 100. And once we're established on that and established on 130 knots, we are going to put on the autopilot to ease our flight and to enable a couple further explanations as we go along. Okay, so that is our discussion of the takeoff complete. So let's go ahead and take off. Takeoff checklist. HSI compass checked, attitude checked, altimeter set, altitude selector set, that's initial, our initial climb of 3000 feet there, weather radar on, we're just going to go straight to the on position over here. So weather radar is on and we are also game, going to give it a little bit of an up tilt of about uh, 5 degrees, like so. Okay, ignition. You turn that on only when you have heavy precipitation, otherwise just keep it in auto. Okay, landing lights on. We did that already when we lined up on the runway. Interior light dim for takeoff, cabin lights off. And then let's go. Park and brake is released. The park and announciator is off. And like that, we are ready to go. Okay, if you're ready, then so am I. Take off. We can release the brake straight away. We don't need to do static takeoff. And now I'm slowly advancing my uh, thrust lever so that we can carefully set the torque to a hundred and not higher. Pretty much like that. Okay, speed is alive. A little bit of aileron into the wind. 85 knots, rotate. So, looking for a pitch of seven and a half, like we have it now. Release the cross controls. Tap the brakes, gear up. 150 knots, flaps up. Okay, 130 knots. Your damper on. 430 feet. And we commence the right turn heading 100 as per the sit. Alright, now trim out the airplane, select reasonable flight director modes, so we are going to go for heading and speed hold, and autopilot on. Okay, let's increase power to the 850 mode, so the flaps are up, as you can see, flap lever is up, and now we put the flap lever into the 850 position. And from here, we can now increase thrust manually over the 100 limit and we're going for 120 or full throttle if that is all you get. Right now I'm at full throttle, you can see I'm getting less than 120 which is fine. Okay then, we are going to continue our climb to a cruising level, 200, 
and then we can also take our first turn towards the south. This is just vectoring that we would get from our traffic control. Like so. Okay, with the landing gear retracted, you will see on the lights up here that the nose light has turned off automatically. However, we still want to turn off the taxi light, just for good measure. Alright then, let's say ATC doesn't want to vector us too much today, let's go direct to Marcy. And go NAV. So, quick check in the FMA, we've got NAV and flight level change. Now, if NAV mode doesn't fly you along the GPS track, then check down here that you're actually in GPS mode. And that you've got GPS on here as well. That is the most likely reason why your airplane might not be following your um, navigation. Okay, so, I told you earlier that I want to show you that little trap with the inertial separator that it is very easy to fall into how to overboost the engine. You can see right now we're getting about 115% torque. Now let me turn the inertial separator off. With the separator off, it is closing and you can see how the torque is increasing. And it is very easy to overboost the engine like that. So now I'm reducing my uh, power lever in order not to over torque my engine. Okay. And that is how you do it. Perfect. So, now that we're in the air, we can go ahead and read the climb track list. So, power lever, observe limits, cabin altitude, cruise altitude plus 1000 feet. So, let's turn this up and have a look at the following. So, the cabin altitude indicator on the outer scale reads your cabin altitude. On the inner scale, it reads the maximum flight level you can fly corresponding to that cabin altitude. You can see we plan to cruise at level 200, so I've set 200 plus a thousand feet on that white indicator over there, giving us a cabin altitude of 4000 feet, and then we can observe the cabin climbing down here. So, continuing with the checklist, cabin climb rate between 5 and 700 feet a minute, cabin differential monitor, that's the PSI up there, cabin temperature as desired and you can see we've got a nice 21 degrees in here let's however increase a tiny bit more something like 23 degrees or so should be perfect okay de-icing systems as required inertial separator as required and that's the climb checklist complete now as required in a checklist always read so oh yeah so what do i need to do well that's quite simple actually so before i start with it though let's have a very quick look Enjoy the marvelous view out on uh, Tampa Bay and on the entire area. So Florida really is among my favorites to fly and uh, it just so happens that I did loads of flights there already in the uh, A330. But let's go back in and continue with our explanation. So de-icing systems as required and inertial separator as required. What does that mean? Well, it's actually quite easy. So, de-icing systems are needed whenever the temperature is 10 degrees centigrade or less and there is visible moisture present. So, if we have a quick look, we can find our outside air temperature down here. We can see it's 10 degree, uh, sorry, 6 degrees centigrade right now. But we can also see no moisture through which we are flying. For that reason, no anti-ice is needed. The next one we need to um, know about is the inertial separator. That basically needs to be on whenever there is icing present. So, currently no ice, thus no inertial separator. Easy as that. Whenever icing is present, then we turn the inertial separator on. As we are climbing, the outside air pressure is decreasing. And as the outside air pressure is decreasing, our torque is increasing, so we need to have a look at the torque gauge to make sure it doesn't go too far. Personally, even though 121.5 is the recommended torque, 
I prefer to keep it a little bit lower, for example at 120 right now, so that I've got a little bit of time when that is increasing to notice the increase and reduce my power lever as needed. So that's just something to keep in mind for our climb and uh, making sure that everything is running smoothly. Another limit that you might be likely to exceed is your engine temperatures. So we can see right now we're running at 806 degrees. Now if we go into the front of the manual then we will find a couple of limitations listed there for our airplane. And amongst those is the ITT which is permitted to a maximum of 840 degrees in the climb. It can go to 850 in takeoff and then 840 in the climb. So that we need to observe. Also we've got a gas generator limit, that's the NG, which is a maximum of 104.1% continuous. So make sure that that is actually um, in limits as well. So right here we can see what I told you earlier, that the torque is increasing with our climb. So I'm reducing the power just so slightly, like that. You could barely see that, and that should be sufficient to get our torque back to about 120, as you can see. So be really careful on that instrument, that is the main message that I want to uh, spread over there. As the climb continues, we have a regular look into our cabin pressurization. Remember, you're sitting in a black square aircraft, so chances are it can fail. So let's quickly understand the indications we have on there. On the left side is our cabin rate of climb or rate of descent. On the right side we've got two needles. One of them is the differential pressure, that's the PSI needle, and that is limited in red over there at 6.2 PSI. On the inner side we've got our cabin altitude, which is reading 3000 at the moment. So the cabin altitude is not limited by this red gauge, but it can go all the way up to 10,000. And indeed your passenger oxygen masks are only going to come out at uh, 14,000. Now in the US it's actually allowed to go up to a cabin altitude of 12,000 feet for up to 30 minutes. However, in commercial operation we don't want to do that. We don't want to go above 10,000. So that is the um, air conditioning that we are monitoring over the time. What's interesting as well to note on the air conditioning is the cabin temperatures. So as we are climbing, the outside temperature is getting colder. Right now, for example, it's minus 5 degrees centigrade already, and it is cooling at a rate of about 2 degrees per 1,000 feet of altitude. So even though it was a lovely 29 degrees down there on the ground, it's minus 6 already up here in the climb. Now, what's important for us over here is that the environmental control system, that's the term I was searching for, may not be able to maintain cabin temperature. You can see right now it's 22 degrees, but especially when you're getting up to high flight levels, say flight level 300 for example, where you've got outside temperatures of minus 30 degrees, the system may not be able to compensate for that difference, and then what you can do is to take the bleed switch and set it to high. That is going to increase your um, pressurization, or your um, rate of temperature control. Right, we're crossing the transition altitude, set standard, and remember once again we have to do it on both altimeters, otherwise you might be running into trouble with the autopilot. So that's 1013, cross-checked, passing flight level 187, now. And you can see both altimeters pretty much read the same. Okay, approaching 1000 to go, let's change to vertical speed mode, we'll click vertical speed engage, and then click that little button here in the middle where it says pull for vertical speed. When you do that, with the large button you can now change your vertical speed in thousands, with the small ones you can change it in hundreds. So let's go for a thousand feet a minute for the remaining thousand feet in our climb and that is what you can do in here. When you push that back in, it goes back to show you your altitude. And you can see altitude is armed with the capture mode there.
Okay, so now that we are above the transition altitude, we can read the transition altitude checklist. So, alt mode has engaged, leveling off in 20,000. Then let's quickly go ahead with the transition altitude checklist. Altimeter standard, cabin pressure monitor, pulse lights off, de-icing systems as required, inertial separator as required, transition altitude checklist complete. Regarding the pulse lights, the pulse lights make the airplane better visible to other traffic. For that reason we are using it below the transition altitude to increase our visibility. However, it also increases the wear of the lights. For that reason, above transition altitude we simply switch it off. Now what is not actually mentioned in the checklist is that we can turn the landing lights off as well. However, we can certainly do that. Okay, and that leaves us with a cruise checklist on which the first pound is power lever adjust for performance. So let's go ahead and have a quick look into what we are looking for. Once again, we need the manual for this and on page number 61 we are going to find those tables. Okay, so up here we've got three different cruise power tables. The first is maximum cruise power, then we've got normal cruise power, and then we've got the long-range cruise power. You can see long-range cruise has significantly reduced torque values compared to the other two, but what we want to use mostly is the normal cruise power. Long-range cruise really only becomes interesting when you want to fly the airplane on its maximum range, which most of you will probably not do, seeing that maximum range is about 1500 miles at a speed of 250 knots, so you can easily guess what kind of time that runs you into. Hint, it's about 6 hours flight time. Okay, so we'll go for the normal cruise power table. We've got flight level 200 conveniently listed out here, and that's a torque of 121 and prop RPM is 2000, and that should give us an indicated speed of 217 knots. Okay, so let's go ahead and set that power. So torque, let's go 121. And now I'm actually confident to increase it all the way up there because we are no longer climbing for that reason. The torque itself is no longer changing either. So torque is set 121 and the prop RPMs to, to about 2000 and the resulting speed, it's still slightly accelerating but we're at about 200 and uh, 14 knots right now, which is totally fine for us as well. Alright, and with that we have reached our cruising altitude. But don't stop here, there is a lot more interesting stuff for the airplane to explore and the first thing I'm going to do after reaching cruising altitude is obviously to read the cruise checklist. The second thing is to determine our top of descent. So let's start with the cruise checklist. Power lever adjust for performance, fuel quantity and balance, check. So you can see we've got a slight imbalance at the moment. The right hand tank contains a bit less fuel than the left hand tank. And you can see as well that as we are banking the fuel measurement is going down. So let me show you that real quick. Autopilot off. Let's bank the airplane. And turn around. You'll see that the fuel needles are slightly changing. Just slightly, nothing big to worry about. And we'll turn autopilot and yaw damper back on again so that our plane is being stabilized once again. But that's just something to be aware of, of those fuel needles moving a little bit up and down. That's totally normal. Okay, so the fuel selector is set to auto. That means that the fuel tank is automatically transferred between left and right in order to keep the fuel more or less in balance. So slight imbalances like right now are certainly acceptable. You can see that the left tank contains more fuel than the right tank and conveniently if we go down here you can see that it switched the fuel selector to the left tank. Now the system will wait until a certain imbalance has developed before it is going to switch. So if you see minor imbalances like we have right now that's totally normal, nothing to worry about. Continuing with the checklist, we've got cabin pressure monitor, which we are doing down here, de-icing systems as required, inertial separator as required, and ignition on if heavy precipitation. And that's the cruise checklist complete. So, next up, let's 
quickly determine our top of descent and to do that let's take out the Navigraph charts to determine our arrival information. So that's our charts up here and we are going to fly the Arnav Approach Romain 9 into Key West. Now that one starts at Strap. Procedure not authorized for arrivals at Strap via Victor 157 northbound, uh, North Eastbound. That's not our case, so we can do that. So Straps, Chats and then Adnor is our intermediate fix. Now that means at Adnor we want to be above 1500, so bus B1500. That is probably what we are looking for. So what we can do now, go to VNAV. Let's say I want an altitude of 1500 MSL, and I want that, yeah, 4 miles before bus B, and bus B is where we start the final descent, so like that we'll have a little bit of uh, descent, uh, a little bit of a 4 mile level segment before our final descent where we can configure the airplane. Vertical speed profile, we'll go for 2000 as that is our target descent speed, enter, and you can see that now it says that we can begin our descent in 4 minutes and 40 seconds. The rest of the setup will go for an LNAV VNAV minima today, so 425 feet is going to be our minimums, so we can conveniently set our speed back to 425. What you'll notice as well is that on top of the speed back here we can also use our radio minimums at 422, so let's do that. We take the switch up here, put it to decision height set, and now we can pre-select our decision height, which is going to be 425 feet, so we'll just round it to 430, and then return the switch into the normal position, and like that our minimum is pre-selected. Last thing we're going to do is to cross-check that our arrival is correct, so let's have a very quick look into the flight plan once again. So looking down here, we are going to compare the tracks and distances, as it is an on arrival, and we've got Sting on a 245 track, 23.8 miles towards, uh, uh, sorry, it is actually a 217 track, 17.4 miles to chat, and that is what we have over here, 219, 17.4. Then we're going to continue on uh, 183, 5 nautical miles towards Adnor. Okay, so that's Adnor 185, 5 miles. Then we continue towards Busby on the final tracks of um, 093. We've got 095 in here. 2 degrees is acceptable. And we can see that it's 6.5 miles. And we've got that in here as well. And then from Busby, same track, 4.5 miles, which we have in here as well, towards the runway point. The missed approach then straight ahead towards a Rarpy, or Barpy. And then a left turn towards Guchil, and we're going to climb to an altitude of 3,000 feet for that missed approach. So with that, our GPS is checked, and we are all set to go. Let's switch back to the VNAV page. Two minutes till we start our descent. So I'm just going to leave the VNAV page active, actually. Now one thing that is pretty handy for you to be aware of, that I want to bring into this tutorial, is going to be down here the engine trend monitor now on here you've got a lot of different pages and I'll just about show you the most important ones first of all if you've exceeded any engine limits then it will be shown to you up here apart from that you've got loads of useful stuff like the shaft horsepower the specific fuel consumption and so on going down to the nav page that basically just backs up GPS stuff so not that interesting for us but down here on the fuel page we've got a couple of interesting things. Like for example fuel to destination, fuel at destination, specific range, fuel flow, fuel used, and most importantly the time remaining. So in our case we've got 2 hours and 29 minutes of fuel remaining with the current fuel flow and the current fuel on board. Apart from that if we go down to air data there's some interesting stuff down there as well. For example, going down here, we've got the flight timer. In case you've been wondering why I didn't start a timer when we took off, here's your reason. The plane does it automatically. And then down here, we've got the um, temperature, density altitude, pressure altitude, 
But this one here is an interesting one. That's your indicated airspeed, 218 knots. Remember the table, 217 should be the target for our current power setting. But we've also got the true airspeed and the Mach number. The Mach number becomes especially important when you're flying at higher altitudes, because this is your only source of Mach number in the cockpit. Now, in Europe, when you're flying in upper airspace, all speeds are going to be referenced in Mach number, so down here is where you can get it. And that's the important thing I wanted to show you. Apart from that, we've got our descent to target indication already, so let's go ahead and initiate our descent. We're initially going to go down to something like 5000 feet for our initial approach, then we're going to use vertical speed mode, pull the knob out to set our target vertical speed. Now we can see it down here, V as required, 1992, so we can just about go to 2000 using that um, large of the two knobs. In the descent we let our speed increase until we have 230 knots and we are going to maintain those 230 knots. Now in case you don't have the GPS available to you, and rather prefer to do your um, VNAV management manually, there are some tables in the manual once again that are going to give you your typical descent figures. So if we have a look into the manual up here, you can see that all the way in the bottom we've got a descent performance manual. You can see from 20,000 feet we need 44 miles doing 230 knots and 2000 feet a minute. So that's quite a useful table that you can use there to manage your flight. You don't have auto throttle, so remember to pull your power back. And we're about to approach the transition altitude, so let's quickly check on the latest Q&H. Which today is 29901. So, passing transition, set Q&H 29901. We do that on both sides. 2991 cross check passing 17,600. Now, checked. Okay, time to read the descent checklist. And to set the cabin altitude down to field elevation. In the manual it says field elevation plus 500, but I really found different sources there, so I'm just going to go with field elevation, which in case of Key West is zero feet. Okay then, let's go ahead with the descent checklist. Altimeters, local, cabin altitude, field elevation, pulse lights on, and at that same time I'm going to turn the landing lights on as well. De-icing systems as required, inertial separator as required, airflow distributor as required. Now what is meant with that? Well that's actually quite easy. If we have a look at the airflow distributor down here, by default it's set to normal. And to normal means that the system can use its entire air in order to keep the temperature under control. However, you can switch this over to the left to the defog position, as you can see over here. And if that is switched to defog, then it is going to use the hot air in order to defog your windows. Now, fogging isn't quite simulated perfectly in Microsoft Flight Simulator, so instead what it is doing when you set it to the defog position in uh, the simulator is that it is going to work as somewhat of a windshield anti-ice. However, today I don't anticipate us to need that, so I'm going to go right back into the normal position. But that is what the checklist item, airflow distributor, actually means. Next up, ignition on if heavy precipitation, fuel quantity and balance check and fuel auto selector shift to fullest. So right now we're on the right hand tank automatically. We can see the left tank contain contains more fuel. So I'm going to press that shift button up here. And as you can see, pressing shift, shifts it automatically to the left and that is what we're going to run the approach on. Easy, isn't it? So we're about to start a right hand turn over Sting. We've got a little bit of weather over there. Let's see, what's the temperature? Currently plus two degrees, so I do anticipate some icing as we go into there. And with icing anticipated, let's turn on propeller de-ice, windshield heat and the inertial separator. As the inertial separator comes on, it takes between 20 and 30 seconds to do so. You can see how our torque is decreasing, while the other values, notably the ITT and the NG, are remaining unchanged. So that's quite an important one to have in mind 
as you're operating the inertial separator you are re you are losing some thrust and the other way around okay now the inertial separator is open you can see the master caution flashes to alert us to the light that's just came up okay then starting the right hand turn quick look into the weather radar as well so this is a 35 mile range let's bring that to a decent range here let's say 20 and 20 up here is okay we might just about scratch that rat return over there let's actually bring it back to a lower range so we might just about scratch that so we might do a little early left hand turn however this is 16 miles so just about here that might just about work and we might hopefully be able to get underneath that little storm cloud there okay then continue our descent 2500 feet actually we can make it 1500 as that is where we are going to start the approach from and like that we can continue our descent so entering some clouds again anti-icing systems are on and looking over here temperature is currently seven so we're about to get into the region where we are getting out of the icing anyway again i'd rather have that sooner than later okay passing 10,000. let's check the cabin pressurization you can see cabin altitude is now at a thousand and descending so that is all good let's reduce that rate of descent a little we don't really need a thousand foot a minute rate of descent on the cabin 500 is going to be perfectly fine Okay, so looks like that cell is getting a bit closer. I'd rather avoid that. However, in Microsoft Flight Simulator, those weather cells don't really do much of a difference. I promise you, if you fly into this in real life in Florida, you're dead. In the simulator, for the purpose of keeping things simple for the tutorial, we are going to ignore that weather cell and fly right into it. Okay, so temperature is plus 11 now, that means we can switch our anti-icing systems off. So prop, windshield, windshield, inertial separator, all going off. And again, as the inertial separator goes off, have a careful look at your torque as that is going to increase. So for the landing, we need to get out of the 850 mode that we enabled. Ooh, that was a nice piece of lightning there. So for the landing we need to get out of the 850 mode that we enabled earlier on. How do we do that? Quite easy. We need to be above 1500 AGL, the torque needs to be a low, uh, below 100, and then we simply take the flap lever and place it from the 850 position into the up position. With that done, our torque limit is now again 100, and we can fly the approach like that. Okay, a little bit of press up over here. We'll keep an eye on the wings, but what's the temperature now? 15 already, so there is certainly not going to be any more icing. So that is all right. So we're approaching the final turn, gonna turn in about three miles. Let's start getting that speed back a little bit. So I'm going to reduce the torque rather significantly. On the base leg, I want something like 180 knots, and that is usually going to provide us with a fairly good rate of descent. And a fairly good controllability of the airplane, while not being too fast. Actually, 180 on the base is also the ICAO standard speed, so that is what we are going to maintain. As our airspeed reduces, let's also reduce our rate of descent. We can see the target reduce on our GNS 530 over here already. And I'm just going to go for something like... 1500 should be totally fine speed slowly coming back as we're turning onto the base and that's it all right a little bit more weather coming up over there i would say that's a typical afternoon florida weather so totally normal okay quick more check on the pressurization you can see the cabin altitude is almost at zero increase that rate a little bit more when I pulled the power off then it lost a little bit of the bleeder that it could use you can always go bleed high then the cabin is going to be um, easier controllable but at the cost of more fuel and we don't want that okay so speed is below 180 
there's two reasons for us for doing that. First of all, the approach is going to go a little bit slower. That means not as much of a fuss dealing with um, everything going quick. The second thing is, below 178 knots, you can extend the flaps into the approach position. And that is what we're really interested in, because once the flaps are in approach, we can also lower the landing gear at the same speed, and that is going to provide a sufficient drag in order to get the airplane down fairly nicely. Okay, turning on to the final. Speed is stabilizing somewhere about 160 and a bit. That is totally fine. So we're joining the 10 miles final now. Speed 160 is looking good. And over here you can see something special now. Now that our GPS has switched into approach mode, you can see it's on LPV guidance over here, we also get corresponding indications on the um, EFIS displays. So you can see that for an RNF approach it's even calculating a glide slope for us, so all we need to do is on the approach mode, and with that the airplane will be able to fly itself down totally perfectly on the approach. So that's our first view on the lovely Florida Keys coming up right in front of us. A couple of the keys visible over here as well. Beautiful. Okay then. Four miles, four and a half miles to the descent. That means we're nine miles out. I'll let the speed decrease slowly so that we don't fly the approach too quickly. And then we can go to flaps takeoff and landing gear down. We don't fly low drag approaches with this like we do in the airlines. No need to worry about that. Okay. Then we can start with the B4 landing checklist. Cabin lights off, altimeters checked, decision height set. Uh, fuel quantity and balance is looking good, it's perfectly balanced now. Inertial separator, we turn that on for the landing when the speed is below 200 knots. So the inertial separator can come on, remember you will lose a little bit of thrust as the thing comes on. So increase your power as needed. So propeller lever, max RPMs. Landing gear down, flaps approach, landing lights on, and I'll also switch the taxi lights on already. And with that, all that remains is the autopilot and the flaps full once we are under 122 knots. And with that, we're pretty much prepared for the approach. So, going to start our descent over at Busby, let's quickly talk over the landing while we're on the approach. So, most important thing for us to notice here is the approach speed. Now, if you're at heavy weight, you want to approach at 85 knots. The same goes for whenever the autopilot is engaged. You don't want to go below 85 knots. If you're at lighter weights, then you can use 80 knots for your final approach. So, we're about approaching 4 miles. We can see our field coming up ahead. Weather radar suggests that we are going to have a fun day over here, but let that not be our problem for now. So, 0.2 miles, you can see a glide slope is coming in, and we are going to catch that in a moment. So, over at Busby now, approach mode, glide slope is active, and the plane is now going to follow this. Speed is below 122, flaps landing, and all that remains is autopilot off. Now, in terms of the autopilot, one click is going to disconnect the autopilot, the second click is going to remove the flight director from view. But we want to use the flight director for now, so let's keep it on. Alright then, so let's talk about the landing technique. We're going to approach at 85 knots. We want, if we want to touch down on time, then we need to pull the power just before the threshold. And that is normally going to give you a nice way to lose your speed and to get the airplane down onto a nice little flare all the way to touchdown. Flare the airplane, but don't force it to stay into the air for too long. Nose wheel landings aren't that much of a problem in the TBM, so don't worry about those. Okay then, let's also quickly talk about the go-around procedure. So go around if we need to, power lever, 100% torque, flaps into approach, landing gear, retract with a positive rate, and then basically go back straight back into the normal approach procedure. And that's really it. That's all you need to do. 
Alright, let's enjoy our view for a second while it lasts on the outside here. Before we need to get back into our manual landing once again. In case you're wondering, I've downloaded this um, scenery from flightsim.to and it's looking really, really good, isn't it? So that's uh, flightsim.to for the um, photogrammetry over here. And then we are running the FS Dream Team scenery for Key West itself. Alright, on the landing itself, power lever idle, reverse thrust as needed, and braking as required. You can stop the plane almost in an instant, so for this landing I don't even anticipate the need to, re uh, to use reverse thrust. However, we shouldn't forget to set our missed approach altitude. Okay, minimum, continue, and below the minimum let's disconnect the autopilot. I've just clicked it twice to get rid of the flight director as well. Your damper off on short final, like so. And now it's all on us to fly this one down. So wind coming from ahead at 14 knots. We are rather heavy, so I'm going to keep the speed at 85. Okay, straight on the puppy, on the center line. and on speed, that's how we want it to be. Approaching threshold, thrust idle. Fair enough, you can do that a bit later, but you can see immediately how the plane keeps descending a bit stronger like that, and that is really what helps us out here. Okay then. And here we are, right on the markers. And that's it. I've just used a little bit of uh, manual brakes there. You can see how well the airplane is slowing down, how it needs literally no runway at all. Okay then, let's get up our Navigraph charts once more. That's a little bit uncomfortable here with that lag, but here we go. So, the Kate next takes away to the right. Here we go. So let's get the airplane off the runway and once we are completely off the runway we are going to run the after landing checklist. What you might have noticed is that I'm running all the checklists as read and do rather than as flow and check as you would do it in an airliner. Okay, so let's get the complete airplane behind the line. I'm also going to turn slightly onto the taxiway already, like so. Then let's stop for a second in order to run the after landing checks. Our parking is located just over here, so that's nothing to worry about. Okay then, after landing checklist, de-icing systems off. And that's all off. Inertial separator on. On. Bleed air. As required. I do want to keep the bleed air on because of the high temperatures here. You can see we've got like 30 degrees outside. If I turn the bleed air off, it's going to be sweaty hot in here by the time we shut the airplane down. Okay, weather radar off. Flaps. Up. Landing lights. Off. I'll also turn the pulse lights off at this point. So, the checklist says strobe lights off. I don't agree with that because we are using them as a substitute for the beacon. So, we are going to leave the strobe lights on. And finally, oxygen off after landing checklist complete. Alright, let's taxi to parking. For taxi, the same things apply that, all that I made you aware of for the taxi out already, so I'm not going to repeat them. Keep the plane slow, anticipate those turns, and use differential braking as needed in order to get your airplane where you want it to go. Right, we're going to park straight in front of that hangar over here. So let's just taxi straight in. Both sides are clear, there is nobody on this apron. 
Which, seeing this weather, I can somewhat understand, but you get where I'm going with that. Okay, we'll park just in front of the hangar. Don't fall for your temptation, don't taxi into it, okay? Just don't do it. And here we go. Okay, that leads us to the shutdown and securing checklist. Park and brake on. Park and brake annunciator illuminated. Taxi light off. Bleed air off. Cabin differential is depressurized. Fan flow as required. I'm going to keep that one on um, auto. And the um, air conditioning we'll set off. So, power lever idle for a minute. Do keep in mind that taxi time does count for that, so we've basically got that one minute already. Okay, gyro instruments off. Ephus master off. Then autopilot and trim master off. Radio master off. Propeller feather for 15 seconds. So put that into feather, we can observe the RPM drop as our propeller is feathering. And then those 15 seconds you'll just about have to make out in your uh, mind. Okay, that should be roughly 15 seconds, so condition lever cut off. Okay, auxiliary boost pump off. Then auto fuel selector manual. Tank selector, pull to off, so click right here in the middle to pull it out, and then we can rotate it into the off position. Okay, inertial separator off, that's down here. Uh, we'll also turn the pitot heats off, by the way. Um, exterior lights all off, okay, the propeller has stopped, so we can safely turn them off, like so. Interior lights all off, ignition off, generator Selector main, source selector, off, and crash lever down. And with that, you have successfully completed your first flight in the TBM 850. So, let's open those doors. So, press to unlock first. Observe that we've got red stripes over here on those indicators now. And then we can open up the door. And also put down the ladder. Right, that's for the front. Now let's move to the back again and open the uh, aft door as well. Once again you've got the press to unlock and then you can open the door like this. When the door is opening we can lower down the ladder. Again the key to the baggage door is located just over here and with that we have now completed our flight. Thank you very much for joining everyone. I do hope that you have enjoyed this tutorial. If you did do let me know in the comments below. I'm looking forward to see you all again on the next one. In the meantime if you've liked this one, don't forget to leave a like to the video as well and subscribe for more. And finally, if you really, and I mean really love what I'm doing, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link in the video description below. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching and I see you all again on the next one.